All these people are interested in stoicism? <laughs> what are you, nuts? Um, the Epicureans are meeting around the corner, by the way. Ah, oh, I know, right? They have free drinks. Um, no, just kidding. OK, so uh, how to be a stoic. Uh, actually, the title of the book uh, that I'm going to be briefly talking to you about is a handbook for new stoics. Why would anybody want to be a stoic, and why do we need a new handbook since there's plenty of uh, really, really good books that were written 2,000 years ago? Well, first of all, because they were written 2,000 years ago. Uh, and so the language is not exactly that accessible. Also, we learned a few things from science and philosophy in the last 2,000 years. Not a lot, but enough to, uh, to, to come up with a little bit of an update on, on the basic concepts. But let me start out with why. why. Why would anybody be interested in this kind of thing? Well, Stoicism is a philosophy of life, one of a number of philosophies of life. You probably have heard of others. Epicureans, I just mentioned, uh, is, is one, Epicureanism. Uh, Buddhism is another one. Uh, it may be a religion. It may be a philosophy of life. In fact, I don't think there is much of a difference between the two in some respects. I think that a philosophy of life has essentially two components. A metaphysics, which is a general account of how the world hangs together, how, how things work. And an ethics, which is a general account of how we should behave in that world. Right? The notion typically is that in order to figure out how to behave in the world, you need to, to know something about how the world actually works. Otherwise, you are liable to mislive, to, to, to live a life that is not really in accordance with, with how things work. So every religion in the world is also a philosophy of life. Right? I grew up Catholic, for instance, um, and uh, you do learn two things. You learn about metaphysics. You know, God created stuff, and he, he, he basically controls what's happening in the world. Whether you believe that metaphysics or not, that's a different issue. But it does have a metaphysics. And then, of course, you go to church on, on Sunday mornings to learn how to deal with other people, how to, to behave uh, as a decent human being, and so on and so forth. So the differences between different philosophies of life and religions, in my mind, are actually rather minor. Uh, there are a lot of similarities between Stoicism and Buddhism, for instance. Uh, even Epicureanism is not really that different once you get into the details. But they have enough differences that uh, different philosophies or religions will uh, speak to certain people and not necessarily to others. That depends in part on your cultural background, on your personality, on where you are in life, etc., etc. So when I started getting into this kind of stuff a few years ago, I did explore a number of possibilities. I read a little bit about Buddhism. I read about Epicureanism. Of course, I knew about the standard religions. And nothing really clicked. Uh, and then all of a sudden, one day, I saw, of all things, on my Twitter feed, I saw something that said, help us celebrate Stoic Week. <laughs> I said, what the hell is Stoic Week? And why would anybody want to celebrate it? Uh, but I was curious. I kind of vaguely remember the Stoics from, from high school. And I, I signed up, and it immediately clicked. Right? So as soon as I started reading Epictetus, Seneca, and Marcus Aurelius, I said, oh, this guy is actually talking to me uh, in a way that I understand. And here we are five years later. I'm still talking about it. So, let me, so that's, that's why we're doing it. It's, uh, everybody has a philosophy of life, whether they realize it or not. Either because you inherit it as your religion when you grow up, or, uh, or your philosophy as you grow up or because you still go through life with a certain general understanding of how the world works. That's the metaphysics again. And you also presumably have some kind of intuition, at least, of how to behave toward other people. And that's your ethics. Whether you actually have it spelled out uh, and you thought about it or not, it's, it, that's, that's the difference. And the, the bet that with my co-author, Greg Lopez, uh, we make in the book is that it's better actually to know about this stuff, what to think about what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it, rather than just wing it uh, for your life, for your entire life, and then you get to do your deathbed and say, oh crap, could have done better. <laughs> There's no do-over, yeah. uh, as, as, as far as we know. Uh, so that's why. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about stoicism in particular, and then what I want to do is to give you just to give you sort of the, the really basic stuff. And then, actually, I'd like to walk you through a couple of the exercises in the book, because this book is very practical. It's got very little theory in the, right in the beginning to get you uh, going. But then it's actually 52 exercises, which if you uh, have enough endurance, you can go on for an entire year uh, to do, one, one per week. Uh, if you don't have that level of endurance, however, or at least you're not that committed at the beginning, because I understand that's a, that's a hell of a lot of commitment, 
we do provide a cheat sheet at, begin at the beginning. We say, okay, here are the nine crucial exercises you want to go through. And so you can just invest a few weeks, see if it works for you. And if it doesn't, well, you only just wasted up 20 bucks or something. So, um, so first the basics. Uh, Stoicism started out uh, about the, the, the near the end of the fourth century uh, before the modern era. Uh, in Athens, uh, the guy that established the philosophy was uh, Zeno of Citium. Zeno was actually a merchant, and uh, he lost everything that he had in a shipwreck uh, right outside of Athens. He made it uh, to the city, and of course, what, what, what would be the first thing you did if you just lost everything in life? You walked to a bookstore. That's what he did. And if you walk to a bookstore, what happens? Well, you obviously you hear the owner of the bookstore reading out a book about philosophy. And in particular, uh, in, that, in that case, the Memorabilia, which is a book by Xenophon about the life of Socrates. So Zeno got, like, he was very interested, and he asked the, the bookseller, he says, like, where can I get me one of these, meaning a philosopher? And, and the books, bookseller said, over there, there is one just walking by, because that was ancient Athens. Athens. You know, people were walking by, and chances are that they were philosophers. Um, the guy in question, it's a different world, you know, it was a different world. The guy in question was uh, Cratus of Thebes. He was a cynic philosopher. Cynicism doesn't mean what it mean, didn't mean what it means today. In fact, many interesting English words, cynic, skeptic, stoic, and epicurean, don't mean what they meant in ancient Greece. Um, and that, that could be a whole interesting talk right there, but I'm not going to do it now. So uh, Zeno started st studying first with uh, Cratus, then with other teachers, and eventually he felt confident enough to sort of start teaching on his own. Uh, and he started doing that in public, in a place called the Stuopo Ikile, which means the painted porch, uh, right in the middle of the market near the Agora in central uh, Athens. And that's why the philosophy is called Stoicism, because it started out in the Stoa. So Stoas are where public markets, public colonnades, where people would gather. So Stoicism from the beginning was for the people. Was they were interested in talking to the people uh, that were just walking by, as opposed to most of the other schools, uh, which established themselves in the suburbs outside of Athens so that they wouldn't be bothered uh, by you know, people unless they were in really interested. So that's how it started. Now, the basic ideas are three, fundamentally. There's one basic uh, assumption that comes with the philosophy, and then there are two major ways of practicing it. And so I'm going to go briefly through that, and then we'll get to the exercises. The basic assumption of Stoicism is that we should live life according to nature. Now, before you run into the forest naked and start hugging trees, <laughs> that's not what it means. There's nothing wrong with doing that. If you want to do it, go ahead. Um, uh, but, but that's not Stoicism. Living according to nature means that we should take seriously human nature in order to decide what kind of life you we want to live. Because otherwise, uh, uh, after all, we are in fact human beings. We're not lions, we're not chimpanzees, we're not something else. So there are certain things that work for human beings because of the nature of humanity, or what it means to be human. Now, of course, different people have different ideas about what it means to be human. Uh, the whole concept of human nature has been under discussion in both science and philosophy for literally 2,000 years. The Stoics had this notion, however, that there are two fundamental components to being human that trump everything else. One is that we're eminently social animals. We're not the only social animals, obviously. Uh, there are social, other social primates, there are social insects, and so on. But we are fundamentally social. We can survive on our own if we have to, but um, even for long periods of time. But in fact, we thrive only in social groups. We seek recognition, we seek affection, we seek relationships with other people. So that is, that is a fundamental component of a good human life. The second thing that distinguishes human beings is the ability to reason to a far greater extent than any other species on Earth. We can have a whole separate discussion. I'm, I'm a biologist. We can have a whole separate discussion about the extent to which other species are capable of reasoning or not. But hey, it's just us here. There are, I don't see any chimpanzees discussing philosophy at the moment. So we definitely have an ability to reason far above uh, and beyond anything else on planet Earth. Now, whether we use it, well, and we use it often, that's a whole different thing, um, but we are capable of it. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today 
to the Institutes of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.